forgotten all about teaching the devil's dictionary. And that is kind of stunt teaching, isn't it? To do a Socratic discussion on a dictionary that's written to be intentionally evil. Um, so we're really happy to have this book out, Theology in California from Ashgate. It's got, um, how many chapters does it have? It's 14 or 15? It's, uh, several chapters. We'll Twelve. go over. What's that? Twelve. Twelve. Oh, well, they seem longer. <laughs> Um, we'll go over some of the things that are in the uh, uh, book itself uh, here in a bit. Um, I'm Fred Sanders, my co-editor Jason Sexton, and one of our authors, Bob Cavolo. Um, let me start with uh, theology with a local accent, and I'm going to read you a few lines from, I'm not going to read this whole book, I'm going to read uh, a few lines from East of Eden uh, by Steinbeck, certified California author. Um, here's a picture of him, looking grumpy. This is the opening of East of Eden. Steinbeck says, the Salinas Valley is in Northern California. It's a long, narrow swell between two ranges of mountains, and the Salinas River winds and twists up the center until it falls at last into Monterey Bay. I remember that the Gabalan Mountains to the east of the valley were light, gay mountains full of sun and loveliness and a kind of invitation so that you wanted to climb into their warm foothills almost as you want to climb into the lap of a beloved mother. They were beckoning mountains with a brown grass love. The Santa Lucias stood up against the sky to the west and kept the valley from the open sea, and they were dark and brooding, unfriendly and dangerous. I always found in myself a dread of the west and a love of the east. Where I ever got such an idea, I cannot say, unless it could be that morning came over the peaks of the Gabalans and the night drifted back from the ridges of the Santa Lucias. It may be that the birth and death of the day had some part in my feeling about the two ranges of mountains. From both sides of the valley, little streams slipped out of the hill canyons and fell into the bed of the Salinas River. The Salinas was only a part-time river. The summer sun drove it underground. It was not a fine river at all, but it was the only one we had, and so we boasted about it, how dangerous it was in a wet winter and how dry it was in a dry summer. Once, 50 miles down the valley, my father bored a well. The drill came up first with topsoil, and then with gravel, and then with white sea sand full of shells, and even pieces of whale bone. There were 20 feet of sand and then black earth again, and even a piece of redwood, the imperishable wood that does not rot. Before the inland sea, the valley must have been a forest, and those things had happened right under our feet. And it seemed to me, sometimes at night, that I could feel both the sea and the redwood forest before it. Now, Steinbeck, I think, is kind of a clumsy author by his own admission. He's not what you would call subtle. I think his motto is something like, to the stars on the wings of a pig. So he knew that his, his methods were kind of, um, kind of uh, clumsy. And I, I think I see that in the opening pages of a big, fat, ultimate California novel, where he goes, you know, let me talk about the the mountains on either side of the valley and how they sort of symbolize for me ultimate things, you know, the birth and death of the day. And then, as if that's not enough to kind of put California uh, existence on this global sort of a, a canvas, let me now dig a well and go down, bore down into the deep, deep history of this place and talk about sort of layers of uh, iconic things and even finding redwood, right? Like. A, I'd be surprised if we didn't find like Disneyland or something. And then we found Disneyland. You know, it just as the well as the stuff comes up from the digging of the well, he finds all of this history and he reflects on this. You know, Salinas River isn't much, but it's all we've got, so we brag about it. And if you were to bore down in this place, you would find layers and layers of stuff. Well, that's the kind of thing we're looking into with the uh, theology in California project, theological engagement with California culture. We would like to so indwell California existence that we're able to write theology that has a certain kind of California accent. Um, I don't think we're gonna be as explicit as drilling down into uh, the history of California in the same way that Steinbeck does, but metaphorically, there's something to that. And when I say cal theology with a California accent, I don't mean saying dude a lot at the end of every sentence. I mean really inhabiting the thought forms as they are in California. Now, of course, California is a huge place. If this is a kind of a regionalist project, um, California is a funny kind of region uh, because it's also a state. It's a state that's kind of too large by any decent sense of scale of what a state ought to be shaped like in, in the US. 
And if you think about the religious history of a region, California is a bit of an outlier. So if I said, okay, let's do a little bit of regionalism here. Tell me about New England. Okay, now tell me about the religious and theological background of New England. You'd, you'd surface some Puritans. You got Jonathan Edwards. You got all kinds of stuff there in New England regionalism. If I said, okay, let's do the South. Start thinking about the South. I said, tell me about religion and theology in the South. You'd have some touch points pretty early on. If I do California regionalism, which is what, one of the things we're committed to here, you'd say, well, A, I'm not sure anything that big is a region. Maybe you want to just drop that and talk about the West, right? Um, and B, there is no religion, right? Like, by the time you're out here, the story's so diverse and so intentionally secular at some of the key points um, that it's not going to be a very strong theological story. Well, part of this project is to disagree with that and say it might take some digging, it might take some coaxing, it might take some paraphrasing of the way we conventionally understand ourselves in California, uh, but I think we can get to a theological account. Um, I'd also like to do theology with a California accent in another sense. I read a lot of theology. Most writing in the theological guild still observes the academic standard of trying to sound like it's not from anywhere, right? So. All academics want to speak universally as if they are not located anywhere, and they are only saying the absolute truth that applies to all people. Um, theologians especially want to do that because, in fact, we are talking about the one God, the maker of heaven and earth, and so it is, there is a reference there to something absolute and not conditional or located. Um, and yet, uh, I hope there's a growing awareness that in the craft of writing theology, um, local sources are usable. Now, when I say that, I'm engaging a little bit in theological method, and there are a couple of methods that are dominant in 20th century theology. One is represented by Paul Tillich here on the cover of Time Magazine. Tillich championed theology of correlation, and the other is represented by Karl Barth, also on the cover of Time Magazine, um, representing a theology of proclamation. Really briefly, correlation says, oh, as theologians, we know all the answers. We got them from the Bible, but what we need is the right questions. And so the culture, and especially philosophical expressions of the culture, generates these questions, and then theologians look to the Bible for the answers and correlate the two. And so Tillich and, and people who are into correlationist method in theology can come up with some pretty sophisticated things, and they're not naive about the fact that the way you frame a question predetermines what kind of answer is possible. Uh, they're actually interested in that, so they will, correlationists will tend to talk about mutually critical correlation where the theological answers are allowed to say, oh, thanks for that philosophical question. I think it's a dumb question, and you should ask it a different way, right? And they're also able to say, our answers aren't just ready-made answers that we just broadcast. Um, they are actually shaped by what kinds of questions are coming to us. So that's a, a rich tradition. I think it also tends to align better with a kind of theological liberalism. I'm more at home with um, a more Bardian approach in the sense of a theology of proclamation, where Bart studied this correlationist stuff and said, yeah, very interesting, yeah, very interesting indeed. Um, I'm not sure you really ever need to do that. I think, I think that what you really need to do is bury your nose in the Bible, and as you are saying to yourself what you are reading, your lips will move, and when your lips move, that's your theology. Like, that's what preaching basically is, is you're like looking at what God has said and going, I think I'm starting to get this, and when you start saying that, um, you proclaim. Now, correlationists make fun of proclamation people by saying, basically, you take the message of the Bible and treat it like a brick and throw it at the head of your audience. Um, and depending on how much of a proclamation kind of person you are, you either think, oh, no, no, we're nicer than that, or you think, you're darn right, that's what we do. We throw bricks, Bible bricks, at the heads of audiences because people are hard-headed and they need some solid proclamation. Like I said, I'm more comfortable on the proclamation side, but I'm also a nice guy, and I actually am curious about the head I'm throwing the brick at. And so I would want to put the way I practice this kind of theological localism as a kind of curiosity regarding the audience at which I am hurling the biblical answer. But here's an even friendlier way to put that. I swiped this from an art historian, and they're always friendly. This is um, Wheaton professor Matthew Milner on his, on his blog. Posted six theses on theolocalism. Right, so theolocalism, I, I don't view this as either of the methods that I just talked about, but uh, Milner says this, when biblical and Nicene theological norms have been sufficiently internalized, theology can encourage unique regional developments, right? So the standards are up first, I like that, okay, it's got to be biblical, and 
Uh, we can't really go back on some judgments rendered by the church at places like Nicaea, right? Like Jesus is God, one, one, one person in two natures, things like that from Chalcedonian Christology. When those have been observed, then beyond that, you can say, well, let's encourage some regional developments. Wouldn't it be neat if there were like a particularly Southern theology that was helpful and a particularly New England theology? Um, number two, localist efforts to combat modern transients should therefore infect theological method. So here's kind of getting into the broader cultural movement to, to realize that we're kind of at sea in this sort of monochromatic global culture where everywhere you go, McDonald's is the same, right? That kind of McDonaldization, that standardization of everything. And the kickback on that to say, the pushback on that to say, no, no, let's actually cultivate some local goods. And he says, that impulse, that, that Wendell Berry-itis, that's a good infection and wouldn't be bad if theologians began developing it. Number three, if a given place hasn't yet made a distinct theological contribution, it should consider doing so. So we are considering doing so. Number four, theological localism means thinking with those closest to you, a sort of 100-mile intellectual diet. So that's interesting as you're looking through your, um, uh, the index of a theology book and saying, where are these people from? It would be interesting if one of the things that happened to be going on is like, wow, lots of Californians there on purpose. Number five, what theologians thought matters, of course, but so does where they are buried. Okay, <laughs> number six, this is not to be nativist, but to exploit native resources for the sake of the universal church. Well, that's the overall um, project uh, in terms of the method, and that's why a mostly proclamationist kind of theologian like me is really interested in this kind of localism. It's not to transfer over to the correlation project. I'm not excited about that, personally. Um, but it is to do that kind of theological localism that Milner talks about. I want to move now to uh, what I think what I've been calling on these book promotion events my favorite chapter. Right? And you can, you're my witness, right, Jason? I've wow. been saying Bob Cavolo's chapter is my favorite chapter. It's a great uh, chapter. And I wrote two chapters, so I'm promoting you ahead of those. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. That's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Bob, will you introduce yourself briefly and sure. tell us what's in your chapter? Sure. My name is Bob Cavolo. And uh, I am a PhD candidate at the Free University of Amsterdam and at Fuller Seminary. Uh, this is a delightful chapter to write. It's on a theology of California surf culture. And as a surfer, uh, who uh, there's nothing more fun than be able to kind of merge two things you love, theology and surfing, and, and put them together. Uh, one of the things that, that really struck me when I began exploring the subject was that there was an entire body of literature on surfing. Uh, in fact, uh, there was, uh, there you can actually do, do studies at University of California, San Diego in surfing. Um, I think you might be able to get a degree in surfology or something at certain places. A lot of Australians um, also are publishing quite a bit, sociologists and psychologists, um, religious studies. Uh, people are talking about surfing as an alternative religion. And so there is quite a body of literature already at large. Uh, and one of the great things about the subject is Californians uh, actually have had a tremendous impact on surfing. And in fact, although surfing originated in Hawaii or maybe even argu arguably uh, in South America before the Hawaiians, uh, in fact, the international movement of surfing really has been shaped by what took place in 20th century California. And uh, what I wanted to do was retrace the history of that and show how, uh, of all things, the Beach Boys played a tremendous role in de-theologizing what had been a very theological sport. In fact, the Hawaiians had an entire, uh, surfing was very deeply integrated with their religion, and, uh, and uh, the early movements of surfing in California, a lot of it was uh, a lot of people attempting to try to get in touch with a more um, deep religious engagement with nature. Um, but it was with the Beach Boys that surfing became uh, commercialized, it became uh, a matter of consumption, and that image was then transported internationally with the success of the Beach Boys, so that the way in which people think of surfing really in Australia, in England, around the globe, um, was shaped a lot and even fed back over to Hawaii by what took place in California in the mid 20th century. Uh, my, my desire was also in this chapter to um, talk about the different ways we can engage theologically with powerful cultural practices. Um, and in a certain sense, my chapter is an apologetic. In a certain sense, I think local theology is very apologetic. Not in that we're attempting to um, use the, the local language in order to give a new argument for God's existence,
but we're attempting to look at uh, particularly powerful practices like surfing um, and understand how our Christian faith makes sense of that. And if we don't, other worldviews, other, um, other social imaginaries, as Charles Taylor would talk about, will make sense of those practices and will then capitalize on that. Because people that surf, it's, it's, it's a self-authenticating truth if you surf. You know that there's something right about this and, and you know there's something in the practice that um, is uh, it's self-authenticating. And so you wanna make sense of that. And in fact, there's books that Buddhists write that try to make sense of surfing. And there's even a Jewish uh, rabbi who's written all about how Judaism and surfing really work together <laughs> nicely. And there was nothing out there for Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was great joy to write this chapter because I felt like um, uh, it was a chance to finally give a voice to what so many Christians believe. So many Christians in the 60s and 70s uh, who were born again and saw their faith and their practice as surfers coming together, and in fact, a number of ministries, um, Calvary Chapel Surfing Association um, uh, being one of them, and I can't remember all of them, but uh, a host of them, kind of surprising number of ministries have seen strong resonance in California, and we're launched out of California in merging this practice with, um, with their Christian faith. And so in the chapter, I really have three movements. The first movement is, um, if we're to use kind of the correlationist versus the proclamation. It's the first chapter is more of a proclamational approach. I take a, a look at this issue of leisure within the surfing community. I don't know if you saw the movie Surfwise, but in it I, I make an argument that the film actually uh, portrays a man attempting to deal with the brokenness of time, temporality. He's very troubled by the institutionalized nature of the way in which we exist, our um, instrumentalized approach to time that we have in California culture built a uh, around a strong economy, and he tries to escape that. And so uh, Dr. Paskowitz um, leaves his medical profession, travels around in a van with his children, and uh, this is actually, it creates a tremendous tension in the film. You kind of leave wondering what should be our approach. Does surfing offer a new approach to living life in which we have a different engagement with time? Does it answer that? Does it, does it cause new problems? And, um, and I make the argument that, that surfers uh, a lot of surfers have noted that there seems to be something wrong with our experience with temporality. A lot of it is um, drawing from the Hawaiian sense of island time in which it's a different approach to time. You're not so much worried about instrumentalizing time and using it to produce goods and services, but you're living in the moment in tune with the, the ebb and flow of nature, with the waves, so to speak. And, uh, and from that, I launch into um, Augustine's view of the fallenness of time, and I'm, I make the case that uh, St. Augustine in Confessions chapter 11, which incidentally happened to be the launching point for the whole discipline of phenomenology and philosophy, that's a whole other subject, but that Augustine ended up um, uh, actually addressing something that a lot of surfers are looking for um, in looking for the perfect wave, and in so doing, um, experiencing temporality as it was meant to be experienced. The second movement in my chapter, um, I actually uh, go into the poetics. That means the actual practice engaged with meaning of surfing. And, and uh, there's a lot of ways in which um, people attempt to quantify what takes place. You know, surfers just say, dude, you know, <laughs> this guy, as a surfer, I love using that apophatic language once you've caught a great wave. There's not a better expression than a non, uh, than, than a, than a non-kind of uh, uh, sensical exclamation than just do, you know? And when you're doing that, you're actually doing something. It's not because you're an idiot. I mean, I, I, you know, I think I'll keep saying dude even when I get my PhD finished. <laughs> it's not that you're an idiot and you have nothing else to say. It's because your experience is such an embodied sense of knowledge in which you now have... Um, uh, you've entered into a certain kind of vertigo on the wave. You've encountered the natural world differently. And so in this chapter, I might be more of a correlationist in the sense, or this section of the chapter, in that I'm attempting to understand the internal logic of the practice. And, uh, and this is where a lot of people who turn to Eastern religions and talk about becoming one with the wave appeal to this kind of experience that I, as a surfer, and those of you who have surfed, have had before. Um, this feeling of vertigo, your relationship to space and your, uh, is changed. And in that, I, I draw from a Catholic philosopher named Charles Taylor and say, actually, I think Charles Taylor gives us a better hunch in that um, there's a way in which we're now experiencing the world that 
we who have gone through the Enlightenment and are the children and the inheritors of the Enlightenment no longer experience space the same way as people who did before the Enlightenment. And Charles Taylor talks about the buffered self, the way in which the self, um, the way in which we experience space is very different than people in pre-Enlightenment societies. And when we catch a wave, I make the argument that we're having a detente experience where that, where that self is no longer as buffered as it was. And, and this indeed um, is a little window, I believe, into, and I would say all of neo-romanticism is, is really what tends to carry the Christian faith these days. It's the idea that the world is bigger than what we thought and that there's more, and that more should cause awe and wonder. Um, and so I tease that out in that section. Um, and then my final section, um, I wanna actually get into the biblical narrative itself. Um, and in so doing, I attempt to draw out uh, at, these themes in the Bible, and talk about how these themes, um, in many ways, intersect with themes that surfers um, oftentimes engage with. The sea is a huge theme in the Bible. Interestingly, uh, watercraft is a theme in the Bible. I know we oftentimes think of the ancient Israelites as landlubbers, but there's actually Old Testament scholars that say that ancient Israelites not only knew quite a bit about watercraft, but had a great appreciation and even saw um, great wisdom, God-given wisdom, in being able to navigate the sea. I found that fascinating as a surfer. Uh, I also found, uh, you know, this is all leading up, of course, to um, Jesus walking in the water, but in route to that, I also, I also touched on uh, this whole issue of um, Leviathan in Job and the non-anthropocentric view of the world that uh, Job gets from God. And in fact, a lot of the environmental movements that surfers engage in comes from this non-anthropocentric view of the world. And that's in scripture. Um, in fact, um, um, it's ironic that a lot of the literature that we see is deeply antagonistic towards um, evangelical and particularly reformed strands of the Christian faith because in fact, that same non-anthropocentrism that you see in a lot of the environmental movements that surfers champion because they view us as part of, and when you go in the ocean, you know you're part of a larger economy, you're part of a larger environment in which you are one player. Um, that, in fact, is what Job is told. Uh, you need to pay attention, you are part of a pecking order and there are bigger creatures on that order and, and they can kill you. <laughs> and if you've ever thought about a white shark eating you when you're surfing in California, um, it can put uh, some healthy humility into you. Um, so that's how I end that before getting to the issue of walking on water, which is, of course, the great proof text. And uh, I think people are a little let down in that section of the chapter because I don't uh, actually say that Jesus was the first surfer. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm just trying to be true to the text, and maybe this is where my brick hits hardest. Um, but, uh, but I do... There's a spirit. Right? Yeah, there's a spirit, absolutely. So, uh, but I do end by showing that there is plenty of um, intersections between the narrative of scripture and the, the world of surfers to, to understand that scripture um, does intersect. It can be a language that speaks into the world of surfers. So anyway, I, it, was, it was a joy to write and I'm just grateful to be a part of this project because um, I, I do believe that at the end of the day, if, you know, I, I actually went to Talbot, I studied philosophy of religion, I learned a lot of great arguments for God's existence, but I found that if you can't address the powerful practices that people are experiencing. Um, they're very localized practices. The very, the, the, the warp and the woof of their cultural realities. Uh, if your theology and your theological language doesn't address that, it becomes a dead language. It becomes a language for people that are talking to themselves. And the average people that live life want to know, uh, you know, listen, I'm a surfer. This is what really gives my life meaning. You're saying your Christian faith gives your life meaning. How in, the, how in the world could these two possibly intersect? And so I found a great joy to, to actually um, show that they not only intersect, but that uh, I believe that the Christian faith, um, uh, you know, and particularly uh, the way in which California uh, and the soul surfer movement capitalized on surfing demonstrates the deep, deep, um, uh, I guess I'd say, um, friendliness between the Christian faith and this practice. So, yeah, that was my chapter. Right. I've got a question for Bob about this. Um, no, it, was an, it relates to an article I read this morning in LA Weekly about, uh, and I wonder if this isn't a thing that may be particularly 
uniquely Californian. I mean, you described sort of the Leviathan in your chapter and sort of the, the fear um, that a surfer may have there. With, and yet, I think this was um, some restaurants that were just busted for having shark fin uh, in their soup and you know, in the, the food that is being served. And so I'm not sure how that's, I think that's been legislated against, right? Mm. So I'm, I'm, you know, how we then relate to that environment. Of course, the environmentalist movement that's been a significant thing in California um, still has immigrant communities here that are still getting shark fin and mm -hmm. um, as part of their, uh, not only being no, no, no longer afraid of the Leviathan, but now eating it. Uh, which may be, uh, you know, a feature. I also have another question about um, this notion of dude. And Fred, you're the one that mentioned it. It's been mentioned already twice. But this, of course, dude does have a range of meanings, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, it could be dude the wave, or it could be dude, what are you doing, right? Or it could be dude, where are my keys, right? Or um, something else like uh, so this is range, and there's that article that was in The Atlantic, and I think it was last year, on trying to define the meaning of dude, and I think one described how uh, a Westerner views an Easterner who is now in the West, you know, as a dude, so that oh, range. Yeah. Of, That's of, kind of an archaic use now, isn't it? Like a dude ranch. Uh, I was reading stuff from the 1920s where someone referred to uh, a city person as a, a spider-legged dude. And dude meant like someone who dressed funny and, yeah. I, but it's very different from, I don't know, you described it as apophatic language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> as a theologian, that's what I'm going to say. But, uh, you know, I think, I, of course, I'm a little defensive as a surfer wanting to say there's a lot more going on. I mean, there is great, there is, there, there is an embodied knowledge and, and uh, I think this can be said for all sports. So one of the dangers in talking about surfing is it's, it is a sport. Um, you can talk about it in terms of the way in which um, you have many things colliding when you're on the wave. You, it, it is as a result of the practice, which is an embodied knowledge that you can tacitly respond to the unfolding of the wave. And, uh, and there's something about that ability to tacitly respond into the present, in, into the future, um, and there's a sense in which, for, and, and surfers, when they get into the barrel, they'll talk about this. There's a mm -hmm. sense in which you belong in the universe. Mm -hmm. And I can't help as a Christian but think mm -hmm. that there's something about the new creation that's ta that, that, that surfers are tapping into about not only our sense of fallen temporality being diminished, but also our sense of belonging in space in a way in which we, we probably don't yet feel comfortable. So, mm -hmm. yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And it's fun to say. <laughs> I wonder too on this issue, and we've been asked the question before, Fred, last week at Cal State, what's next with this project? And one of the, uh, of course, um, we're studying the body, the ways that California has imaged the body, uh, which does remind me of um, some of the early psychedelic artists that did have Jesus, Surfer Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that on mm -hmm. the calendar if they're down here. I don't know, maybe it was a Calvary Chapel uh, calendar or something. Um, but California sport is also one of those things where, you know, these things come here, and there are some things that I suppose emerge here, like skateboarding from surfers, right, who were uh, found themselves, I guess, in Venice, and then trying to cre really creating a whole another sport, subverting the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the con the suburban Los Angeles concrete to try to come out and play. And I read an article. Uh, from Brian Glenny on this and sort of to, to compete on this mm -hmm. place where you're not supposed to compete. In, Los, mm -hmm. in suburban Los Angeles, you're just supposed to go in your house, enjoy your air conditioning, um, and just be domesticated there. And yet you have these young mm -hmm. people coming out to try to compete and play mm -hmm. uh, in this urban uh, place that's been paved over, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and trying now to come out and re-engage the environment. Mm -hmm. Would you say that there's something, I mean, you've studied surfing and, and as this relates to sport, um, is there something that's unique about California surfing compared to New Zealanders surfing? Right. Well, and that's where uh, my argument is that if you go to New Zealand surfing or Australia, you go there, 
course, they're going to be shaped there, but really the vision of surfing is a California vision. And I get that from Matt Warshaw, who is the preeminent surf historian. Um, and he makes the argument that really California has been more influential in the modern practice of surfing than, than anywhere else in the world. And what you see when you go to Israel and you see them surfing on the Mediterranean, <laughs> uh, you see them attempting to imitate what ultimately um, arose with the Beach Boys. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a shame because um, in some ways, in other ways, there's, there's, uh, it's been redeemed, I think, by a lot of... Um, Christians, whatnot. But I do, I would like to talk about skateboarding, too. I mean, I think there's a whole ecclesiology element to the skateboarding community that you don't find it entirely in surfing. I think that there's a sense of being over and against um, the broader culture in skateboarding. Um, and, uh, and there's something about the aggression to the built environment in skateboarding that I find fascinating. And so we need to write a chapter on that. You just take it, right? Yeah. yeah I think <laughs> so. It is interesting. I kind of assumed that when Jason and I started working on this, we've done several conferences and uh, did calls for papers, a number of things came out of that. And every time that the big religion meetings happen in California, we capitalize on that to, you know, everyone's gonna be here anyway, let's summon some papers. Um, I kinda thought we would publish an academic book on it, a set of essays, and kind of limp across the finish line, like, oh, good. Now the California book's out, we're pretty much done there. But in November, um, the big annual religion and theology meetings are in San Diego, and so we put out a couple calls for papers, um, and we've got another, is it eight uh, papers coming in? Seven. Eight, Seven, eight. yeah. Um, on these themes of the California body, we've got an essay on um, uh, tattooing, and uh, what's Steve Smith's paper on? Um, um, it's on uh, the death penalty. The death penalty, okay, is it Toriel M. Steve Smith, Toriel M. Matt Anderson? We've got a number of um, uh, interesting papers. President of Fuller Seminary, uh, former president, Richard Mao, um, has a chapter in this book um, on uh, California as a theological subject, right. yeah, first chapter, I think. The enigmatic nature of the place. Yeah, yeah. But he's doing another paper um, at the upcoming meeting because he discovered that one of the major reformed theologians in the history of America, um, Gerhardus Voss, the biblical theologian from Princeton, when he was all done teaching and revolutionizing biblical theology, retired to California and wrote poems about it. So. Oddly, <laughs> the, the backbone of Princeton biblical theology is a California poet. Um, I did not know that. Abraham Kuyper made the comment that the future of theology is in California. Kuyper said that? Kuyper said that in the 19th century. <laughs> do you know what he meant by that? Um, I do, but it's a long story. Okay. We won't get into that right well, here. Well, okay. much, much later, of course. I mean, that's after the glory, you know, but, but I mean, Jacques Derrida, you know, thought the same thing. When he, the post was there at Irvine for him to come out, it's, it, Benoit Peter says that he thought that uh, in order to win the West, mm. um, he needed to come to California. And so we have mm. these, a lot of thinkers sort of trying to go to the final frontier, to that place where... Uh, the possibilities run wild mm -hmm. of, of what can happen and what can take root there, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's only for a short time, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It might be very meaningful in that short time, yeah. which it seems like, um, I mean, all these things have happened, and now part of our project is trying to uh, connect theology to these things. I mean, I think yeah. it's an interesting and very significant thing that this, uh, this project is not apologetics and California, uh, nor is it philosophy and California, but very uh, specifically, we chose theology to engage California. Why, why is that fair? Well, it's mostly because I'm a theologian, but, to be honest. Right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, even religious studies wouldn't quite get it because religious studies is a descriptive discipline, you know, more at home in uh, history or sociology. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just something about bringing uh, normative claims out of a discipline like theology. I should say we've done some religious studies in California. The last thing we did in Berkeley um, included lots of reports on religious phenomena in California. It was fascinating stuff. So one of our component, what was the story about um, the, the research paper on um, the woman in California City who Lisa has... Ba yeah, Lisa Battelle, our, our Lady of the something. Our Lady of the Desert or something. She has a vision of Mary every month. like on a schedule, on a deadline like that. A couple hundred people walk out into the desert and she looks up into the sky and she sees Mary and hears things from her. No one else does, they all take Polaroid photos of the sky. Um, 
I didn't know that was happening, so that's an interesting thing. It's interesting, even just at the level of religious studies, to report on the phenomenon that is happening. Yep, that's fascinating. Um, the overall project, though, that we're engaged in is brings theological claims, brings some normative judgments, um, with, with the hope that that's, that's informative, right? Now, if there develops a Buddhist account of California, great. I would love to be in dialogue with that. Um, if there develop other religious account or spiritual accountings of California, I'm not against those. I think, yes, tell me more about what's developing there. Um, but I can't jump out of my skin and cease operating as a Christian, an evangelical Christian Protestant systematic theologian um, coming to this. Um, looking for certain things. There's a certain reach towards the true transcendent um, that I think is built into the categories that I'm coming in with. Right. Do you want to say a little bit about the wider project that produced this book, Theological Engagement with California Culture? Sure. I mean, I think you touched on it with religious studies, and we may be from the, from the conference at UC Berkeley in April doing a volume. Uh, quite possibly we're in conversation with a one publisher about this, and uh, but it's very wider. It's not not yeah. just the tech project involved in that, but it's us partnering with other academic scholars to understand the impulses in this place, especially the weird religious things that have happened. Yeah, I, I got to admit, I've got a real weakness for the really bizarre religious stuff <laughs> yeah. that starts in California. Yeah, yeah. Paul right. mentioned some, of course. Right? You know, <laughs> yeah. and. Um, uh, and, and here it is, you know, this is the place, I mean, John Christensen as well, the editor of Boom and uh, uh, environmental geographer at uh, UCLA, uh, you know, reflected uh, in his endorsement of the book that uh, while religion in other places seems to wane in California, it's, it's continually uh, vibrant. There's mm. a, and something call it, he, he ter termed it Californianity. And if there is something like that, I would, I would, um, suppose that it probably does run through the thread of the whole place, uh, sort of is in the water, as it were. Uh, but I, and part of the epistemology of what it means to be, you know, California and... and, and, and okay, one of the online reviewers mentioned when they saw the announcement of the book, without having read it yet, they said, this is a great idea. They should do this with all the states, or at least all the interesting ones. <laughs> I yeah. thought, wow, that's kind of, I don't know who they're insulting there about these uninteresting states. I, I assume I could land anywhere and find it interesting, probably. I don't know. I haven't, haven't lived in all the places, you know. But um, um, is there some danger, I think, of boosterism, yeah. right? If we're kind of up here saying, I, I keep finding sentences in my head where I say, I want to say that, but it sounds a little cheesy and California boosterish. Um, and then, of course, I reflect, well, that's just very Californian, isn't it? I mean, this place was built on boosterism. It was built on the rumor that if you came here, great things would happen, and that if everyone would just believe us, then great things would happen. It's kind of like having a party, right? Is your party going to be good? Yes, if you are there, <laughs> right? And, and if everyone believes you that it'll be good, lo and behold, magic happens, and it's a good party. Um, is this indulging in a theological version of California boosterism? How special we are, making a list of all the great things that have happened here? Is our project? Yeah. I think that could be a potential, um, and, and yet, when you are in Cambridge, for example, or when you're in the Netherlands, traveling around, at least when I'm in Paris, I can't go very far without seeing California emblazoned on somebody's shirt. <laughs> they may have never been here. Now, of course, uh, I think some of this is trying to reckon with what is this myth-making that happens here? I mean, it, it, it's, as it were, the, ba the, the cat is out of the bag. Mm. We're just trying to now responsibly deal with what, what this is. Yeah. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, it, it could, this could be perceived as boosterism, um, although I don't think, of course, with California's problems currently, the future of California is not going to be built on boosterism. Mm. Um, we, we already tried to trick everybody into coming here plan a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. And part of, part of this then, uh, you know, there are others, it's not just us trying to address the problems, there are historians, sociologists, geographers, and others trying to, you know, cultural critics, really, you know, you think of Zocalo Public Square, and others really trying to get a handle on this place. Um, of course, politicians and academics and, and everyone. Um, who's, who's actually got some st stock in this place. And that's uh, not to be taken for granted because a lot of folks come here wanting something, they're mm -hmm. sold a line, and, and often leave because they find themselves underfulfilled. this place that didn't quite produce. But for those of us who are here, trying to responsibly 
make sense of and understand the impulses that are here. I think, I think that's where this project, um, and especially theology coming into conversation with our other academic colleagues in history, the social sciences, and, and the other disciplines in the university, um, uh, we, could, we could, as a conversation partner, um, hmm. perhaps do some good, perhaps yeah. help. I always compensate, even when I, I was gonna say something like, you know the hymn, um, O sacred head now wounded, has the line, what language shall I borrow to praise thee, dearest friend? And I think, well, in this project, California language. That's right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, um, but every time I say something like that, I think, uh, it's a little booster-ish, isn't it? And then I try to compensate by saying, well, Californians love our place a little too much, but we also hate it a little too much. So maybe there's a, I wouldn't describe that as spiritual balance, right? That's not a good place to be, like a little bit of self-loathing, a little bit of self-idolatry. That's, that's not a healthy recipe, right? It's, it's better to find a place of integrity. Um, but in terms of like public pronouncements and things we're committed to, yeah, there's too much California love. There's California idolatry. Um, it's, it's a projected image of the perfected life, especially for Americans. That's why the eight volume history of California by Kevin Starr mm -hmm. is called Californians and the American Dream. Because there is that, my family just watched through the uh, I Love Lucy episodes where Lucy and Ricky moved to California. And um, I think you could see them as they watched it going, we live somewhere really special, like Lucy and Ricky wanted to come here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and yet you get here, and of course, it's just another place. It's not, it's not the ultimate point of the entire westward migration <laughs> movement of Western man. It's, you know, it's not- Back the, to Eden. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's not Eden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think uh, that mythology is built in. That's where the boosterism comes from. Right. But it's also inevitably, in a fallen world, um, crushed, disappointed, and it brings forth monsters and apocalyptic visions of the end. Um, well, it's the end in the bad sense, right? It's not the end, the goal of all our progress. It's the end. It's the human project is a disaster. It didn't work in California, so it can't work everybody out. Right. Well, I wonder if that's too, I mean, to, to look back at Bob's chapter um, on theology of California surf culture, I wonder if, uh, you know, I mean, there's the wonder, there's the, the literature that your beautiful chapter engages. Um, I wonder if you couldn't get a whole book out of that thing, though, with, with really trying to take um, sort of a surf, you know, a surfing uh, view of, of anthropology, uh, of creation, of, of, uh, of sin. I mean, especially, I mean, we hear these stories of, of surfers, and, I mean, the gangs that sort of coagulate mm -hmm. on the water and violence, you know, that's mm -hmm. not just from the ecology in the water, but um, amongst one another. Right, mm -hmm. um, and the you know, and and, and drugs, and uh, you know, sort of that dystopic, um, and then you know, Venice, right? Like you mm -hmm. have then the whole area just gets overrun. Nobody wants to go there anymore, mm -hmm. um, and and so really destroys a community. Like families aren't out there anymore <laughs> because they're, they're afraid. Right? right, this is the history of the post-war moment. Yeah. Um, well, in that in that note, I do think that just as you could take this example of surfing, and you could, of course expand it much larger. I think the value of this project personally, and why I was so grateful to be a part of it, is because I think that, that the Christian faith always moves forward in a localized context. There is no universal, non-cultural Christian faith that has ever existed. And so what you see where there's a robust Christian faith is the Christians are thinking very carefully about what it means to live as Christians within the real cultures they're in. California is one distinct cultural context. Um, to distill what Abraham Kuyper said very briefly without all the backdrop of the French Revolution and everything else he had in there. Um, Kuyper saw the West Coast and saw California in particular as the place of the future. It was the place of the future and he saw the democratic, the way in which America was embracing liberalism, democratic liberalism, that is suffrage and the kind of civil values, that, uh, I'm sorry, civil liberties that we have in this country, mm -hmm. the way in which Christianity was merged with those in a way which it wasn't doing in Europe, he saw that as the future of Christianity, particularly because he knew that for Christianity to survive, it would have to engage with democracy. And democracy had emerged in Europe in a way that was seen as anti-Christian. And so, Behind that understanding is really what this book is about, which is Christianity always emerges within real cultural contexts in which the various paradigms, the various social imaginaries of that cultural context are thought through and they seem to be able to be thought through as Christians. We're able to take a Christian way of viewing the world and view the very real world we are living in 
which is our actual culture. And so that's why this is such an invaluable project and the degree in which this, it may not be something concrete like a book, but the degree in which what's modeled in this book is then replicated around the world, that degree you'll find a robust Christian faith. I mean, that's my conviction, is that a robust Christian faith is present. And I would probably say the same thing for Buddhist faiths and Islamic faiths, but because we live in real cultural worlds and we have to engage those worlds and the very particularities of those worlds. So it kind of brings it full circle back to your comment you started with, with this localism. You know, this issue of doing theology as a local um, activity, not just simply spouting out universal truths that hold for all times, all places, all people, and we can all just sit down and say we nailed it and call it a day, you know, so. Yeah, good. All right, well, um, before we break, I wanna open the floor to questions. Any, any questions broadly, any, anything that this brings to mind for students here on thinking as Christians in California? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so besides surfing, what are some of the um, essentially Californian things and practices? We didn't actually do the table of contents yet. Do you want to? Sure. Um, just walk you through briefly the table of contents if I can. We had a, uh, participated in a, in, a, <coughs> in a launch in Pasadena last week where Monica Gannis came along to talk about her chapter on the celebrity uh, uh, phenomena and how the church really in California has struggled with that for um, at least in, you know, in the 20th century, but, but even early, even before Amy Simple McPherson, although if you want to sort of locate it at one major sort of jump, uh, she would probably be it. And then, and then you find the church sort of being consistently, persistently lured by the siren call toward the celebrity mentality, um, juxtaposed with the call from Jesus to be faithful, um, mm. right? To love God and to love neighbor and to, to pursue faithfulness uh, to Jesus Christ. But Monica is a Hollywood professional and has a whole book on Californiaism, I think she calls it, as a worldview. Yeah. Uh, interesting book. And it, this chapter is called I Have Adonis DNA. Yeah which is, uh, you may recognize that from the philosopher Charlie Sheen, uh, who was, I think, on, on, the, on the manic side of his swing while she was composing the chapter. Um, yeah. But of course, as she, as she describes it, if I can just, I mean, as, as what she does in her chapter, I'll sketch it briefly. She, I mean, she's showing uh, Charlie Sheen, and, and the reason why folks were so upset, it seems like, with what he was doing, I drink tiger's blood and Evadonna's DNA, because he's <laughs> sort of, he's exposing the whole system with, with sort of what he's become, right? How it just, and Marilyn Monroe's talked, to, I've talked about this earlier, and it's sort of what Hollywood does to one. And, you know, so finds that, um, you know, this, this reality that she's um, giving an account for as a Hollywood insider, um, it destroys people, you know, and, and so why would the church, uh, you know, so, so she's got a very, it writes uh, in a very personal way about some of the, not just Hollywood celebrities, but then how the church has done this. And so I'll re or, sort of give you a quick description and read you the chapter titles. Um, with the sections that are here. The first section of the book uh, we, we entitle Approaching California's Culture Theologically. So here's where we try to get the conversation started. Like how are we gonna do this? And so this is where Fred's chapter on localism is. Rich Mao gives the first chapter uh, reflecting on uh, just the, the contradictions in California, the extremes that are here. And I give a chapter really trying to give an account of, of what we mean by theology, what we mean by culture, how does theology reconnect, uh, both in the university at the academic level and also uh, in the public square. You know, in our state universities, I teach at Cal State Fullerton, uh, but we haven't taught in any of our state universities a theology course since 1871. You know, so it's been in exile for a long time. And yet, there are other significant California figures who would love to see theology uh, represented in the university. And it is in some ways, but it's usually not from, uh, well, we don't have any theology departments or any theology posts uh, formally. So trying to sort of get that conversation started. Um, the second chapter, or the second section of the book, we call California's culture in ecclesial perspective. So here we're trying to 
capture the situation with the church. And of course, we start with the Franciscans and Alan Ye, who teaches here, uh, gives a chapter uh, as a missiologist engaging the Franciscan missions. It's called The Significance of the California Missions in Californian Theology and Culture. And so he looks at the major cities where the Franciscans landed and, and sort of compares that with what's happening today in a missiological perspective. Beautiful um, uh, effort there um, set forth. And Monica's chapter, I have Adonis DNA, Californian Entertainment, Celebrity Culture, and Evangelicalism. So she kind of captures, I think, the first half of the 20th century with uh, Amy Simple McPherson and kind of where that came from. And then as it were, the second half of the 20th century uh, is, is covered in the next chapter by a native Californian who went to UC Davis uh, and pastored a, a large church, uh, a mega church in Folsom, Matthew Farlow. His chapter is called In Pursuit of the Consumer Crown or the Crucified Crown. And he's, he's trying to uh, offer a, a he offers a critical engagement with the California megachurch, which he finds is particularly Californian, although uh, that's probably too hard of a claim to make. Uh, there were large churches before California uh, was even here, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and inhabited by um, uh, you know, Americans, of course. But, uh, and focuses specifically on Saddleback and the, um, the homogeneity principle, which, as we were reflecting on last week, may, I'm not sure, it was brought about by Don McGavran, who was part of the... Christian churches, one of the first of which in California was in Stockton, uh, we found out from uh, a, a lunch we had. And uh, here he is at Fuller Seminary trying to figure out how do we build the church by connecting like people with each other. Um, and this chapter comes, uh, it offers a critical and constructive engagement with, with that idea. The third part of the book we call California's Culture in Theological Perspective. And here's where we move on from the ecclesial situation, which obviously is an important story in California, the, the church. Uh, we move on now to, to deal with specific cultural phenomena. So Bob's chapter uh, is first from the Beach Boys to Surface Chapel, a theology of California surf culture. Um, the second chapter in this section is by Bruce Baker, who is a Los Angelino native, uh, went to uh, Stanford, Caltech, and then Stanford, and found himself in San Diego, got out of LA, uh, but in San Diego was part of a venture capitalist project, uh, and he was a part of building the first pocket PC. And he is a theological ethicist teaching business in Seattle and offers a chapter called Silicon Valley and the Spirit of Innovation how California's entrepreneurial ethos bears witness to spiritual reality. And then another colleague from the Northwest, Paul Lewis Metzger, a brilliant uh, cultural critic and theologian of culture, uh, is not a Californian, but has spent some time in California working with uh, especially African-American pastors in San Francisco, and gives a chapter called Drive-By Evangelism, The Growth of Gang Violence, and community development. So of course, the informal community governance structures we have in California, the second generation immigrant communities that often find themselves gathered together in gangs um, are a significant uh, feature of the California story that Paul um, begins to examine with the vision uh, that the church holds out of, of the church's family. Uh, and often people in gangs or in prisons, of course, the largest prison state in the world, we're in it. Um, not only do we have the master plan of higher education, but the master plan of incarceration uh, as well here. Uh, and, and, and that's often because uh, at home, dad's just not around, right? For various reasons. And so Paul uh, Metzger shows, well, this, this uh, idea of adoption that we find in, in the gospel, as a gospel essential, uh, is part of how the church um, can come into the situation uh, in, in, in um, beautifully uh, healing ways. And then there's a final section um, where, this is, this is the one where, you know, it's been nice and fun up to this point, but the question is, look, okay, if we're really serious about trying to bring theology, okay, the, the, the T word it was called when we were at Green Apple Books by the, our colleague friend uh, yeah. from UC Santa Barbara, the T word, uh, in the public square. You can believe whatever you want in California, just keep it to yourself, okay? Um, if we actually want to try to reconnect theology back to the university and responsibly 
see it done well in the public square? What would that look like? And so, so Fred um, uh, gives a, a fantastic essay, and short essay in this final section, as, addressing the question, is there a theology of California, which is that initial blog post, right? Is there a theology of California? So here he gives an effort, and then a, um, a sociologist from USC, uh, Richard Flory, responds uh, to that question so critically, uh, and then a historian from Westmont College, Richard Pointer, also responds. So here we come back into the context of academic discourse uh, and see what theology can really do. And so in that sense, I think, um, uh, we've really set forth uh, a, a healthy effort uh, at trying to get a serious conversation going. Someone early on pointed out, just in the last month after publication said, um, it's really, it should have been called Southern Theology in California, which I thought was sort of a cheap shot. We tried to bring in Northern California, but by Northern California, I mean the Bay Area, right? I don't mean like, actual Northern California. Um, but in terms of just the list of phenomena that we addressed, yeah, there is, it is a, a little Southern heavy. Yeah. But the, um, major, the majority of the population is here as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, other question, yeah. Yes, <laughs> not yet, but yes. You can just call me Bob if you like, yeah. Can you repeat the question a little for the tape? Yeah, I, I think the question, as I heard it, was um, what would be the implications, just as we talked about with surfing, where we attempted to understand surfing as a practice uh, first, and then after that, um, then understand how our Christian faith might fit with that and what it might say to that practice. How, how, how might we do that with other, other subjects, and what does that look like? Is that a fair representation of your question? I, I, you were much more eloquent. I, I'm sorry, I think I butchered your question, but I think that's the gist of the idea. I really appreciate the question. I think it's really important. Um, my initial response is um, to, to say that you can detect that I think that there is an awful lot of frontier in terms of the way in which practices shape people's everyday lives. And one of the great... Uh, doctrines uh, that I hold to is this doctrine called sphere sovereignty, which is this idea that, that the world is made up, God created the world in such a way that there's lots of little different kind of subworlds, and these need to be respected. Um, they, they, they need to be respected, and Christians need to engage these various subworlds and not just uh, engage the world at large as an abstract. And uh, one of the ways this works itself out, of course, is in a place like Biola, you have, you know, uh, you're taught a discipline, and, and, and you're to engage in that discipline as a discipline. And you do that, um, and you don't erase the reality of that discipline just because you're a Christian. You actually try to understand the conversation that's there. So I think it is very valuable, and I, I'm completely with you on that. Um, my area of research is fashion, and so... Um, fashion theory, which is another emerging academic theoretical discourse. And so I'm kind of like the Apostle Paul. Like, I want to go where Christ is not being preached, right? Like, no one's talking about this academic discourse of surfing, and no one's talking about fashion theory. And the value of projects like this is that inevitably when you attempt to ask the local question, new discussions emerge. Mm -hmm. And the things that fall through the cracks when we're thinking big picture, when you actually you know, you narrow in, okay, we're gonna talk about a particular region and what's going on there. Suddenly what happens is your theology has to take into account these sub-worlds that, um, and surfing being one of them. And I think that's actually exciting because that's the, that's the kind of places where 
we really need to, see, that's where we can see whether or not our theology can bear the weight of the real worlds we're living in, these sub-worlds, right? That are a big part of people's lives. I mean, you'll meet people. I remember when I was 19, I started surfing. If you met me, all I wanted to do is talk about that I was a surfer. And the first thing I tried to do is let that be known somehow, whether what I'm wearing, <laughs> it was such a big part of my imagination. Now I, I, I live, I'll go through the whole year, I don't even think that I'm a surfer. I don't, if people are surfing, sure, let's surf. It isn't a big part of my sense of identity, but for some people, that is their identity. And that is the way in which they construct meaning in their lives. And, and going to surf, that's their liturgy. You know, and they'll tell you, you know, this, uh, people will say, surfing is my religion. And by that, they'll do it tongue in cheek. It's not a formal religion, but they know that they're getting the needs met that they think you're getting met with your religion. I think we need to take that serious. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the clock, and I think we need to uh, call it quits there. We'll hang around and answer any other questions you have, so come on up. But uh, we have books for sale here if you want copies. We got a pretty deep discount, which means $20 on an academic book. That's a, as deep a discount as you can get on a on an academic title. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.